Hello and good morning everybody. This is section 12 of the notes and here we are going to discuss a new method for computing the estimator in regression problems and this method is called rich regression. And this method is made for cases where there is high collinearity and where the least squares estimator which we discussed so far where that does not work so well. And the effect of rich regression is that the estimator is no longer unbiased, but it also does not suffer from the variance blowing up as much as the least squares regression estimator does, and that can lead, we will see, to an overall smaller error in some cases. Okay, so let's see how that is done. Before I explain rich regression, let me just remind you about least squares regression. So in least squares regression, we consider the residual sum of squares, and that was just the sum for all samples of yi minus the fitted values. So maybe we write that as xi transpose beta. And that thing depends on beta, and we minimize this by choosing the beta, which makes this as small as possible. And then that was our least squares regression estimate. So from that, we did a bit of work, and then we found the minimum was at beta hat is x transpose x inverse x transpose y. And these xi here, they are the rows of the design matrix x. Good. So that was least squares regression. And we also saw a problem with least squares regression in the last videos. Namely, if there is multicollinearity, then there can be a lot of variance in this estimator. So we saw a picture, I think, where the confidence ellipse for the betas looked like this, where for the individual variables, not even the sign was determined because it could be positive or negative. So that's really not so good. And the reason for this is that this matrix here was close to not being invertible. And that is like for numbers, if I do one over a very small number, I get something which is very large. And here, if I inverse a matrix which is close to not being invertible, then in some directions I get something which is very large, and the noise comes in via the y. We had the model y is x beta plus epsilon. Here's the noise. And the noise is then very much amplified in certain directions, and in that example we have seen the direction was just the direction of this ellipse. Good, so that's the problem we are going to solve. And rich regression does this by adding an additional term in this function we are going to minimize, which is no longer just the residual sum of squares. Let me write it, so that's lambda sum i from 1 to n beta i squared. And this term here, that encourages beta to be small. So that I then call r lambda in the notes. And that has this extra term compared to least squares regression, which just is zero if all betas are zero, and otherwise it's always positive, and depends on, we could write that as the norm of beta squared, so on the magnitude of the vector beta. Good, and now we have two terms, and there is this parameter here that determines the balance between the two terms, that's called the regularization parameter. And if lambda equals zero, that's not there, and we are back to the original estimate, the least squares regression estimate. And if lambda is large, then the estimator doesn't take the data so much into account and instead just tries to minimize beta. So we will get beta equals zero in the limit. And in between, there may be interesting values of lambda where this estimator may do something which is better than just least squares regression. So in the example we have seen before, if this extra term here is added, then we want the norm of beta small, and the norm of beta is smallest here. The distance from the origin to this point is smaller than the distance to this point or that point or any other point. So what it will do is it will move the estimator a bit towards being in the middle, so maybe we then get an ellipse which is more like that, and that had smaller variance. Now the question is, is this a good idea or not? So before we go there, I want to just 
redo what we did for the least squares regression estimator. So I want to find a formula for beta hat lambda, which is the beta which minimizes that function r. So I'm going to write argmin for the beta which minimizes the function, argmin lambda of beta. Okay, so that's the location of the minimum. Then we just follow the recipe we had for least squares regression. So what we did there is we used matrix notation. We can do the same thing here. Let's do that. So we could write the first term. We know that as y minus x beta transpose y minus x beta. And the second term is not complicated either. Namely, it's lambda beta transpose beta. So that's how we would write this new function with the extra term. Now it's not very difficult, we just have to take derivatives again with respect to beta, set them equal to zero, and we have done that for the first term. So for the first term, the derivative we have seen was minus 2x transpose y plus 2x transpose x beta. And now for the new term, there's no surprise, it looks like beta squared, and if you check the derivative, it comes out as 2 beta, so we have plus 2 lambda beta. Good, and now we set this equal to zero. And this equation tells us x transpose x plus lambda identity beta equals x transpose y. And you see what the result is, then beta, or let's write beta hat lambda here actually, the estimate, beta hat lambda is x transpose x plus lambda identity inverse x transpose y. So that is following exactly the same logic as we did before. And then you need to think about, is this a minimum, a maximum, or a subtle point? But similar as before, it is clear that must be a minimum, namely that is a quadratic quantity. So if beta goes to the outside, that will grow to infinity. And it's like a parabola opening upwards. And if you think about it, the only extremal point will be a minimum in the middle. And from there on, it will grow in every direction. Good, so I leave it to you to check that more carefully. So that is the main thing. That's how we compute the rich regression estimator. Now from there, there is first the question, does this inverse exist? And it turns out that inverse always exists. So for least squares regression, we had to write if this matrix is invertible, then we can define the estimator. But it turns out here we don't need any property of x or anything that is always invertible. Let me just show this how this goes. So in the appendix, which is titled Linear Algebra Reminders, you will find a result I've added about when is a matrix invertible. And there it says A is invertible if and only if, and there are a few criteria, but one of them is AX equals zero has X equals zero as the only solution. And that's a pretty common criterion if you did some linear algebra or if you learned about systems of linear equations, then you probably have seen that. So if there's only one solution for that homogeneous equation, then there is only one solution or exactly one solution for every equation. And then you can always find an inverse, which means A as a matrix is invertible. We have to show if X is not zero, then AX is also not zero. That's the same as I've just written. Good, so let's see whether we can do that. Our matrix A is more complicated. So that is X transpose X plus lambda identity and I want to call my vector v instead of x just to make it clear that is not input data or anything. So we assume v is not zero and then we need to show x transpose x plus lambda v is not zero. And one way to check whether a vector is zero or not is to check how long is it. If the length is zero, then it's a zero vector, otherwise it's not. So I'm going to show that thing is positive. Good. And that, well, we know how to do that. The norm is of x is x transpose x. So the norm of that is v transpose x transpose x plus lambda inverse transpose x transpose x plus lambda inverse v. And if you look at it, that transpose here is not really needed because identity and x transpose x are both symmetric. So they're some asymmetric. 
And now we can just expand that. So we have V transpose X transpose X from here and another X transpose X from here. So X transpose X V, that's the first term. There will be four in total. Then we have plus V transpose X transpose X identity. There's a lambda and then a V. Then we have another of these terms. So that's right, plus two of them. And then we have V transpose lambda identity, another lambda identity V. So that's lambda squared times the norm of V. Good. And now we are kind of there. So the first term is the norm of X transpose X V squared. The second term is two lambda times the norm of X V. And the third term is lambda squared times the norm of V, both norms squared. And that's greater or equal to zero because it's the norm squared. That's greater or equal to zero because it's the norm squared. And I haven't said this, but lambda is positive. And I said we are assuming V is non-zero and we show that thing is non-zero. So V is non-zero. So that here is strictly greater to zero. And you see I'm cheating here a tiny bit. Namely, I just wrote lambda is greater or equal to zero. And here I assumed it's strictly greater to zero. So let's just for now write strictly greater to zero and think about it in a second. So if lambda is strictly greater than zero, then this is strictly positive. The others are just positive. And then we know that is strictly positive. So we get if V is not zero, then X transpose X plus lambda I V is also non-zero. Good. That's what we wanted. And this statement here implies then X transpose X plus lambda I inverse exists. So that's what we wanted. Now let's come back to the question with the lambda. So what happens for lambda equals zero? We just used lambda greater zero in the proof. So we have that exists. We have shown that only for lambda greater zero. And that is good because if lambda equals zero, that term here goes away. So for lambda equals zero, the matrix we get is X transpose X plus zero. And this matrix is the one we have considered when we did least squares regression. And there we discussed at length that matrix may or may not be invertible. So for lambda equals zero, this result down here is actually wrong. So result for lambda positive, X transpose X plus lambda I is invertible. And let us go back to where that came from. That came from here. And the consequence is if that's invertible, then that estimator actually exists and is uniquely determined. Namely, that means there is exactly one solution to this equation. So we can continue here. It's invertible and thus beta hat lambda is uniquely defined. And that means we got rid of one of the annoyances of the least squares regression estimator, namely that sometimes does not exist. Whereas the regularized estimator with this penalty term that we have just seen always exists. Good. And now one can do the usual game. We can think about bias and that we just need to do. So we know beta hat lambda is, we've just discussed this, X transpose X plus lambda I inverse X transpose Y. And here I now need to write capital Y because for the bias we need to use our statistical model. And this capital Y I can already fill in is X beta plus epsilon. So model mean plus errors. And that is expectation of X transpose X plus lambda I inverse X transpose X beta. And I want to do something here for the future. Namely, I want to write plus lambda I minus lambda I, which will not make any difference, but you can probably already see that will be useful for the next step. And then we have the epsilon term. That's expectation of some matrix times epsilon. But we have seen that before we can take the matrix outside. So we get matrix times expectation epsilon and that is zero by assumption. So we get plus zero here. Good. So what do we get? You see, I'm already preparing some trick here. 
namely I'm going to split this now into this and that. So that's expectation of x transpose x plus lambda i inverse x transpose x plus lambda i beta minus expectation of x transpose x plus lambda i inverse minus lambda i beta. And you see probably why I did this clever trick, namely these two now cancel, so I get beta here. And then the other term, well, all terms are now constants, we don't actually need the expectations anymore, the random epsilon is already long gone, ah, and I wrote the minus twice, let's have a plus here, and then we get minus lambda x transpose x plus lambda i inverse beta. That's the result. Now, if you look at that, you see that's the correct answer, so the bias is that minus that, but this time the bias is not zero, but this term here is in general not zero, I think it's probably never zero unless beta is zero. That means the new estimator is biased. That's not a good thing, but the bias is small if lambda is small, so here we see we probably want to choose lambda small to keep the bias small, and we will see there are upsides to it, namely in exchange for having the bias we will get a smaller variance. Okay, but for now let's just record the estimator is biased. Good, then for the variance, we need to look at this term we have neglected here. So that splits into two, a constant term which we just dealt with and a random term which had zero expectations, so we could ignore it now. But now when we do the variance, we need to actually do the covariance matrix of this. So matrix inverse, x transpose, epsilon is the relevant term. So we get covariance of beta hat lambda is x transpose x plus lambda i inverse x transpose epsilon and then the covariance matrix of this. And we know how to do that, so that's x transpose x minus lambda identity inverse x transpose, then covariance matrix of epsilon and then the transpose of the matrix in front, so it's x x transpose x plus lambda identity inverse, and that's symmetric, so I don't need to bother with the transpose. Good, and that thing here is sigma squared times identity. So we get sigma squared x transpose x minus lambda identity inverse x transpose x x transpose x plus lambda i inverse. Good, and that's really it. You can do the trick with the add and subtract the term again, but this time it does not really work. You get something where it's a bit easier to see the dependency on lambda, but it doesn't simplify dramatically and it's difficult to do any analysis on that. So what I did in the notes is I stopped here and showed you a numerical experiment and it's written down nicely in the notes, so I think I'll not redo that here, but instead I'll refer you to the notes to have a look at that. But what I want to say is the quantity we are interested in at the end is what's called the mean squared error, and that you can define in two different ways. So let's say we are interested in beta hat j. That is either the distance between beta hat j and the truth squared, and then the expectation, or you can write that equivalently as the variance of the estimator beta hat j plus the bias of beta hat j squared. That's an easy exercise to show that's equal. And we have just worked out the bias and the variance, so we have formulas for these. So you can work out the mean squared error, and you see that measures the distance to the truth on average. That's different from the bias. The bias can be very good even if the estimator is half of the time way too large and half of the time way too small, because that averages out, and on average it would then give the right answer even if it never actually gives the right answer. Whereas the mean squared error is in a sense a better measure that cannot be tricked in this way that measures actual distance between estimator and truth. And if this is small, that means most of the time we are very close. So that's a good thing to have small. And in the numerical example in the notes, what you find there is that the variance decays somewhat like this as a function of lambda. The bias squared increases, 
we have seen that earlier, the bias is this term, and well, there's a lambda here, which makes it a bit harder to interpret, but there's a lambda here. So if lambda goes large, it is believable that the bias increases. And then the mean squared error is just the sum of these two, though that will look maybe like that. And here is an optimal lambda somewhere there, but that is not at zero. So zero here, that corresponds to the error of the least squares estimator. And you'll see for the price of introducing a small bias, we can actually reduce the overall error of this one by having a small but positive lambda and using a rich regression estimate. That effect becomes particularly pronounced if there's multicollinearity. If there's no multicollinearity, the variance here will not be a problem and the rich regression estimator will not buy you much or maybe not anything. But in the presence of multicollinearity, you get pictures like that for approximate multicollinearity or that will go all the way to infinity for strict multicollinearity. And in these cases, the rich regression estimator is a good thing. So this is rich regression. And we are nearly done. But I want in the next video to explain one more small side topic to that. Namely, for rich regression, it turns out it's often advantageous to standardize your variables before you apply regression. And that's what we'll talk about in the next video. So see you soon.